thanks everyone for coming tonight or being online. Um, tonight we have Daniel um, presenting on his um, attempt or well, let's not call it attempt, but on his journey of trying to sort of like set up a course, an introductory course for Python. And he's going to sort of like show what he's got. And it's also about getting feedback sort of like from the community as well, what they think, what's great, what could be improved, or what could be maybe a great addition to the course then as well. Um, just a quick word from our sponsors, as always, um, the School of Computing and Mathematical Sciences um, School. They sponsor our room here and uh, the New Zealand Open Source Society for sponsoring the big blue button that we're using for running the online or the hybrid uh, meeting tonight and also doing the recording. So at some stage, if the recording works out and um, sometimes backend processing has a hiccup, but uh, we'll also end up on our uh, YouTube channel in the park meetups and um, we'll eventually arrive there. So um, without much further ado, I'll give the floor to Daniel and then Peter, we'll start it. Sharing the screen. Fantastic. Okay, um, hello, my name's Daniel. Um, so I'm a spatial analyst at the Waikato Regional Council, and I've got just over 10 years experience working with geographical information systems, also called GIS. Um, my job often involves writing a lot of uh, SQL and occasionally, actually I'm not sure why that's cut off, but occasionally um, I have to write some Python scripts. But one of my hobbies is to create technical courses and I sell these courses on a platform called Udemy. Um, so it, Udemy is also, it's known as like a, they call it a massive online um, like learning platform. I, I forgot if there's a name for it, but yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, what, what's that stand for? Massive online? Open course, I think. Yes, yeah, open course. Um, and it's probably the biggest one. Um, and people list their courses on there, and usually people only buy them when they're discounted. So you put on quite a high price, and then people just buy it when it's... So it's kind of like Frisco's, like they always have a sale on, you know, every weekend. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, um, and I'm currently working on a Python course for, okay, so it seems to be cutting off the uh, slides, I'm not sure why, but I'll just carry, carry on, but I'm not sure that the layout of this is cutting off the bullet points, but it should say I'm creating a Python course for beginners. Um, so here are some of the courses that I've made so far, so as you can see there's a few Oh, a couple of SQL courses, there's a database design course, and I did a fairly brief course on an introduction to APIs. Um, so my best seller is actually the very first one, which is a 13 hours and it's using SQL Server. To make a course, what do you need? Um, you don't actually need that much. You just need a microphone, and some screen recording video editing software. So I use a software called Camtasia Studio. So that's my office set up there. And you can see I've just got a microphone at the front and I've got a boom arm um, and a pop filter here. And there's my desk, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, so there's different types of courses and probably one of the most common is like a code along course. And that's where the instructor just types the code and will um, type the code from scratch and just explains it as they go and goes through the process that they're going through. And these can work quite well, um, but they also have some disadvantages. Um, so I've got here, students have the option of following along by writing the same code themselves. And these courses are typically quite long especially if the programmer is a 
an instructor is like typing like I am. Um, and so making a course like this is a good way to make a quite a long course. And on Udemy, people tend to uh, equate course length with quality. That's not always the case, but often these bigger courses tend to sell better. But I, I don't quite like that. Um, sometimes it's like I'd rather focus on more quality. Um, and so the problems with these uh, code along courses, well, firstly, you can have loss of engagement. Students get bored. This takes too long to cover coding concepts. Especially these days, a lot of students want to, they get bored super easy. So, um, you know, they're used to watching TikTok videos and et cetera. They don't have the concentration um, oftentimes to get through like a half an hour video. And Udemy actually recommends that videos, uh, optimal length of each video is seven to 10 minutes. Sometimes I've done videos that are 20 minutes, but I've, you know, I try to break them up if I can. Um, another con of the code along course is passive learning risk. And that's that students might simply copy the instructor's code without fully understanding it. So they've just got a sort of a superficial understanding and they haven't, it quite hasn't um, sunk in. Um, and then when they get to the real world, they forget what it was um, that they learned. Um, so my, oh, actually I should talk about, so my course, I do do a bit of code along, but I also try and put a lot of stuff into PowerPoints. And I also try to have the code pre-written and that just saves a lot of time. One, because I'm slow at typing and two, just allows me to focus more on the explaining. Um, so the course creation process is, I'll prepare some PowerPoint slides and some Python notebooks. So for this course, I primarily used Python notebooks. Um, I just quite like that you can run a cell and you can kind of I don't know, compartmentalize the code and it makes it a little bit easier for the students to follow it, to follow. Um, and for the PowerPoints, I write down a full transcript beforehand. So I write down everything that I'm going to say. Um, so that's because I'm not very good at improvising. So, and it, <laughs> it also gives me time to kind of like think of the best way to say it. And I try to show what the code is doing step by step. So I'll have some examples of that soon. Um, and just one note is that I don't write the transcripts for the Python notebooks um, because it just would take a bit too long and you're trying to look at the code and also the transcript. Um, so instead I might just write some bullet points. I use ChatGPT, um, so I never used to use ChatGPT, but now I'm using it all the time um, to help create the coding exercises and to explain coding concepts. Now, there are some people who are just complete, you can ask ChatGPT to create a full course for you, but I find the quality wouldn't be so good. Um, but, you know, there's a bit of back and forth between myself and ChatGPT to try and um, come up with some good examples and try to um, explain things. But that certainly helped. And it, it's also helped for my existing courses because um, I have to answer course questions. So before I was spending maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes a day ask, uh, answering student questions on Udemy. And now that's down to maybe like 10 minutes a day because I can just paste those student questions into Udemy and it gives me the answer. Oh, sorry, yeah, ChatGPT. And um, yeah, so that, that saves a lot of time. I, I'll, often I'll need to edit their questions, but it's quite good, especially when people are having trouble um, setting up SQL Server and they've got very machine specific problems. And then I can um, use ChatGPT to help that with that. Um, I want to, I just threw this in here, it's a bit sort of, um, so something that I think about when making course is something, a concept that some of you may have heard of, which is called the curse of knowledge. 
and it's a cognitive bias where experts find it hard to explain subjects to beginners. Um, so I'm pretty sure you've all had someone who's like a genius and then they're terrible at explaining something and this is the reason why, this cognitive bias. And it's because experts often assume that the concepts they find obvious are also clear to others. And this leads in gaps in explanations or instructions. So experts may find it challenging to pinpoint where learners are struggling, as they might assume certain foundational knowledge that the learners lack. Okay, so how can we overcome the cure, uh, curse? Um, one way is getting feedback from learners. Uh, can help the instructor identify where the gaps are in, in their teaching. And so Udemy, um, Udemy, you do get that feedback. So you get that feedback on student reviews and you also get it in the QA forums where like people will say, I'm really not understanding this part of it. And so often I've gone back and redone a particular video because it was like the same questions were coming up. Um, and another thing is just being mindful of one's own journey when they were learning, trying to think back what it was like, um, which can be a bit difficult if you've got a bad memory like myself, but just trying to think back what it was like because we all struggled at the beginning. Um, and also, yeah, we can try and break down concepts using simple terms, realizing that a lot of the terminology that we use, um, the, the students might not have a you know, the same understanding that you have, um, et cetera. We can use analogies. I'll talk more about analogies in a moment. And relatable real, real world examples. As you guys know, programming comes with a lot of jargon and it's essential to explain terminology before using it. So a lot of my um, lectures will have uh, to start by explaining some of the terminology that I might be using. Um, and a lot of it would be stuff that other courses might not explain because they think, oh, they, they should already know this, and often they don't. Just a word on analogies. Analogies can be effective for simplifying complex concepts, but they can also be problematic. Um, the main reason is oversimplification. So sometimes analogies can oversimplify a concept to the point where the details are lost. No analogy is perfect, and there are often parts of the analogy that don't map well to the actual concept. So for these reasons, I tend to not use analogies that much. Um, but when I do use them, I try and have an actual explanation as well, because I found that some courses, you know, they'll use analogies all the time. Um, and then I, I don't think that's so good. That's my personal philosophy anyway. Um, okay, so that's the end of the slideshow that I've got. Um, I thought what I would do is I go through and I just go for a few of the, um, the uh, lectures that I've prepared. So I think I'll go this one here, which is the Morgan's Laws. Wait, is that opening up? Oh, there we go. So this is kind of what I do. So I've got what I will say here at the bottom, and um, and I've basically prepared everything. Uh, so in this one here, I've got a bit of an introduction on um, who De Morgan was. Sometimes it's good to have a bit of history in there. Um, and then how he came up with his logical laws. Um, so some of you, so sometimes people aren't actually that familiar with it. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I sort of debated whether to put it in the course because it is a course for beginners, but I threw it in there anyway. 
Um, so De Morgan's laws, uh, they involve um, conditions which have negations. So here's an example. I just explained the terminology that I'm going to use. And then I'll cover um, the material. And so that's De Morgan's first law. So if you expand that out, we get um, not instead of uh, not A and B in parentheses, it's the same as not A or not B. Um, I did this one because it can be quite confusing and it's confusing to me. Um, so I, that's why I made a lecture on it. And when I looked on the internet for how other people had, so, you know, YouTube and other courses, um, if they'd explained this, and I couldn't really find a good explanation for it. So I think the one I came up with I was quite proud of. So uh, I did an example where it's either raining or not raining and you're wearing a jacket or you're not wearing a jacket. And you've got, so you've got those two scenarios and then you've got what's called a truth table, true or false for the different situations. And so I went through the first law, which is saying not R and J in parentheses is the same as not R or not J. So a student might think, well, why is it or not and? And here's how you can show how these two are equivalent to each other. So in the first situation, you have raining and wearing a jacket, which is true, true. And then for everything else, it's going to be not R and J. So that's all these other situations here. And then you can show that that's equivalent to if you did not R or not J. So if one of these conditions, um, not R or not J, so if at least one of the variables is false. Yeah, that's right. And you can see that it's the same. Um, so that's, I try and make it a bit visual like that. And then I might try and explain things uh, in different ways. So here's the more traditional way of showing it, which is like a full truth table. Um, yep, so the next one was a code demo for De Morgan's laws. So sometimes I'll just show you the concept and then the next lecture will be a demo and then you'll have an exercise. Um, oh, and then I threw this one in here as well, which uh, negations are confusing equals true. And then I've got not negations are confusing, so it's not equal true. So you've got a double negative, which is a positive true. Um, okay, so I'll go to the next one, which was the demo. Um, oh, damn it, did I not put that in here? I may not have put that in here. I think I've got the actual video. So here's the video, if this works. Play a bit of this. Welcome, Welcome back. back. Now we're, now going, to we're going to take a look, take a look at a couple, at a couple of situations, situations where we could where we apply De Morgan's, Morgan's laws, laws in Python, in Python code. code. Also, also, I'm going to, I'm show, going to show how each example, example can be written, written in, a way in a way where we don't, we don't need to use, use De Morgan's, De Morgan's laws, laws at all. At all. However, However, the second, the second example, example, which involves, which involves checking for error states, states, is a situation, is a situation where I would where recommend I would using De Morgan's laws. Okay, okay, before going, before through, going the through the code examples, examples let's just do a just quick, quick recap, recap on negations. On negations. Okay, so okay, in this so small, in this small piece, piece of code, we have a variable called, called negations, negations are confusing. Are confusing. And this and is assigned to the Boolean value, value true. true. Because, because, well, well negations are confusing, are confusing for us humans, for us humans to, understand. to understand. On the next, On the next line, line of code, code, we have the not, not operator. operator. So we're so going, we're going to, to negate, negate what comes, what comes next. next. So we, so have, we have the not, the not operator, operator followed, followed by, by the negations, negations are confusing, confusing variable. variable. Then we, then have, we have not, not equal, equal to, to true. true. So, so take, a take a minute to think, to think about, about what you what think you we think would we get, get if we if ran these ran two lines, two lines of, code of code in a Python, in a Python notebook. notebook. Okay, okay. So, so if we if were we to, run to run this in a Python, in a Python notebook, notebook, we would get, we would the, get the output, output true. true. So let's, so go, let's through go through this, through this step, step by step. By step. So, first so first we're asking, asking Python, Python, is the variable negation I can using not equal to true? So is it not true? Now, now, this condition, this condition is, false is false because, because the, variable the variable is, is true. true. 
So this so variable, this variable we've, set we've set to true. To true. So when so we, we ask, ask if this, if this variable, variable is not, is not true, true, then this, then this will, will be false. false. But in this, in case, this case, we put, we put a, a not, not in, front in front of this condition. This condition. So this, so this not, not operator, operator here, here will, will negate, negate this, condition. this condition. When we say when we negate, say negate it is, it will is return, return the opposite, opposite of, of whatever this, this evaluates to. So, so this, this operand, operand evaluated, evaluated to, false, to false, false, but because we have the not, not, we reverse the false, the false and hence and when we run the code, we get true. true. So this can this be a, can bit, be a confusing, bit confusing, but uh, this is this how it is with, with using negations, negations particularly, particularly when using, using the not operator, operator and, and also, also having this, this not equal, equal to operator, operator as, well. as well. Okay, with okay, that in mind, in mind let's, go, let's through go through the first, the first task. task. Okay, let's, okay, let's say, say we were working, working at a company that ships ship ship products, products within, within the United States of America. However, However, when shipping, when shipping products, products within, within the United, United States, States, we want, we want to, charge to charge a higher, higher shipping rate, rate to, our to our customers if we're, if we're not shipping, shipping the goods within, within the continental, continental United, United States. States. So there are so two, there are two states, states which are not within, within the continental United, United States. States. That is, that they're is not they're connected, connected to any, any other states, states of America. America. These are Alaska, Alaska which is the state code AK, and we have Hawaii, which is the state code HI. Okay, okay, let's take let's a look take at the, look Python, at the Python, code Python code for how we, can, how we do can do this in a Python, in a Python mode. mode. Okay, okay, so, so our, our task, task is to write, is to write a, simple a simple program that charges, that charges a, higher a higher shipping, shipping cost. cost. I, I don't know if you want me to carry on or just sort of skip through the video, or uh, <laughs> um, I might just sort of skip through the video. So, um, yeah, so I'll go through that example there. And actually, I got this example from somewhere else, um, and I kind of modified it a bit. Um, but I found that all the examples that I would get um, from this one, and I also asked ChatGPT to generate some code examples as well, all the examples of where I used in Morgan's Laws, I could actually write it in a way that didn't use negations. So in this case here, it's got if not state code does not equal Alaska and state code does not equal Hawaii. Or you could write that as um, if state code equals Alaska and state code equals Hawaii, then set the shipping cost to $10 higher. Um, otherwise, if it's any other state, the continental states, set the shipping cost to $5. Um, so then I wanted a, well, I sort of asked the question to myself, well, if I can always rewrite it, why would we need to use the Morgan's laws at all? And um, towards the, uh, so that's kind of preempting what the student may ask. And then um, towards the end, then I showed an example of where you would use De Morgan's laws, um, which is I've got a note here that they tend to be more useful in situations where the condition is naturally expressed in a negated form. Um, so, for example, if you're working with a system that has several error states and you want to do something when the system is not in any of those states, then you might have code that uh, naturally looks like this. So you would say, if not error state 1 or error state 2 or error state 3, um, then, uh, you know, do something. Yes. Um, David from the online audience has a suggestion with the if not. Okay. Because, yep. um, David, do you want to go ahead? Or shall I talk through? You can look at feedback. Oh, you've got info. Oh, okay. That's all right. Um, yep. So I'll do it. Um, so he was saying because rather than having, I mean, the lecture is about the Morgan's laws, but um, in Python you could make it a little bit easier where you just check if not in that list of Alaska or Hawaii, mm. then do that rather than doing if and or. So that would be a slightly more Pythonic way of doing it. Mm. But since you're explaining um, the Morgan's laws, mm. I mean, it's probably best sticking with that. Yeah, that's point taken. I think um, that one, I wasn't quite happy with that example either. Mm -hmm. And that, that example actually came from a book, um, Python for Everybody, mm -hmm. and I'd slightly modified it a bit. Yeah. Um, 
I think this one's a bit more Pythonic example. Yeah. So the other example is a bit more Pythonic. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, the other one I wouldn't, wouldn't have written like with the double negation, I would have never written it like that. No, it yeah. It, it was a weird way of doing it just to mm. show how to apply the yeah, yeah, laws. So, and um, I mean, do you then, in that course, also say how to make this code more readable and therefore more maintainable? Yeah, so actually, if I go to back a bit, um, so if I go to, um, where is it? Oh, this down here where I've got if state code yeah, yeah. equal equal relay score state. So that's the a way how you most people would typically write it. They wouldn't yeah. use negations at all. Yeah. Um, actually, I should go through that a bit more. Okay. Yeah, so that's the way people would typically write it. Yeah. Um, but then there's, so the question is that I, I'm preempting what the student will say is, well, why would you, we ever use De Morgan's laws? And the answer is, um, you know, in situations like this one, where the um, expressions are more naturally expressed in a neg negated form. So if not, there is state one. And so you could always write it like the following down here. Um, so you could have written it like this, if error state equals equals false and but this is not Pythonic um, and is you know arguably more prone to errors. So that's where you would so if you don't want to write it like this, then you have to use you have to apply and you have to know De Morgan's laws. Um, so that's one example. Um, Okay, another example I've got here is actually uh, while loops. So let's go go to the while loops um, PowerPoint first of all. Uh, when when the um, person watching your <coughs> video and seeing the slide. Do they actually see the little chat? No, they don't. No, so that's on the other screen. They'll just see the presentation. So that's, I'm just, so you're getting insider's look as the, yeah. the full thing. Okay. Um, I should mention as well, what, so one of the, so one reason is um, I wanted, I'm not an expert programmer, so I've been trying to learn some more Python, but <laughs> occasionally at my work I'll write a Python script, and, and I'm, I know what, I know how to do that, um, but um, I've kind of been like uh, learning as I've been going, I have to admit. Um, and I remember reading in a book, like the best way to master something is to actually teach it. And I've found that in the past as well. So, um, uh, and uh, on Udemy at the moment, I believe that Python is the highest selling um, topic. Um, and the I think there's 1,300 courses, and the top course earns over 100,000 a month US, but the median course earns $20 a month. So there's a huge discrepancy um, in that. Uh, yeah. So, okay. Now, this one here is on while loops. So here I've just got a brief explanation of what a while loop is. Um, and then I'll go through some example. And each slide, I will highlight the part of the code where I'm up to as what, what I'm explaining. Um, and so that's the sort of the approach I take. Um, so here I'm just explaining each part of the code. Um, so here's your increment operation. Um, and you'll probably notice that uh, this isn't exactly that Pythonic, where, you know, most people use the plus equals operator. Um, but I think I've explained that in a, another lecture. And then I'll just go through here on um, each iteration. So on the first um, iteration, I is zero. Um, so the condition is true, zero is less than five. Um, then it prints I and then it increments i. Um, so then I'm going through each, so you can see it's taking, takes a bit of time to go through each one. 
Um, but, you know, when you start it, I wanted to kind of give like a, you know, better explanation and more quite visual for the learner. You know, I found that was one good way to do it. Some students prefer to see a diagram, so I've chucked in a diagram here of, um, of the while loop. Um, and then uh, I've got sort of the questions to think about when writing a loop. And uh, I got this idea from um, an instructor on, um, he's, he's actually got, um, he's got some good videos on YouTube. His name's Andy Harris. I think he's like a computer science professor. Um, and he, he likes to say that um, he'll think of four questions, which is what is my loop variable? How will the loop start? How will the loop iterate? And how will it end? And usually when a student is having a trouble with uh, a loop, it's because they don't know the answer to one of these four questions. Um, so I'll go through the answer to those questions. Um, and then I've got another example here. Oh, this example here was of an infinite loop. So if you forget the um, increment operation, you get an infinite loop. Um, here as well, I'm just comparing as well the while loop to a different way you can do it. So in Python, there are many ways to do different things, um, to do the same thing, sorry. Um, so on the right hand side, we're using the um, range uh, to do the same thing, which is printing um, number zero to four. Um, and then also thinking about um, giving some instruction on when to use while loops. Um, so we use them when we don't know how many times we need to repeat an action. And the advantage is that they will keep going until that condition is met. And so I chucked this in here as well, because I haven't seen really anyone else talk about it, which was a mindset shift when thinking about while loops. Because when you're a beginner, while loops can actually be pretty confusing when it comes to the condition, um, because it's counterintuitive. And that's because in real life, we tend to think of ter in terms of when to, when to stop a task rather than when to continue it. Um, so we've got to go from this end condition thinking to this continue condition thinking. And then I just gave some sort of everyday examples. So the first one here, driving to a destination. So the end condition is I will stop driving when I reach my and when I reach my destination. And so that's how we naturally think of it. But the continued condition is different to that. So the continued condition is I will keep driving as long as I haven't reached my destination. Um, and then I've got some other examples here, like filling a bathtub. So I will stop filling the bathtub when it's filled. And the continued condition is I will continue filling the bathtub um, as long as it's not filled. Um, same for reading a book, etc. Yeah. With that different mindset, it's probably also why other programming languages have a do while rather than just a while do. Ah, so good. it's post yeah. and pre and post condition when you're checking. Yes. So like, I mean, coming back with old fashioned Pascal, where I actually started with, um, you had to repeat until um, we had to check at the end. And so it was always quite handy, depending on what the problem was, what was more natural to have the check at the start or at the end. Yeah, but you have to at least keep it at least once. Yeah. One, one is sort of like it executes once it's repeat until, and the while can never execute for instance. Interesting. If okay. the starting condition is never true, yeah. depending what falls in for instance. But yeah, and I mean, I found it a bit sad that Python doesn't have sort of like the other way around as well, but. It's interesting, yeah. Well, Python has some really interesting new constructs on this compared to in general, but. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of nice things in there yeah, that I actually really like, but this is one thing that I quite often find sometimes a bit awkward, where I know it has to run at least once, so I have to it's rough. awkward sort of like rearranging things in order to make it run through once and then yeah. 
change the condition at the end so that when the next time it runs through, oh, no, it follows through and then it doesn't get executed. But, mm. Yeah. Sorry. It's still, no, no, that's good. I didn't actually know that. So. Um, yeah, so that was, I've called that one reframing everyday activities. Um, and then I kind of, here it's kind of like saying driving home the as long as we could replace with while. Um, so try and go from English language to Python. Um, and then I give an example of this first condition here would be say while not destination reached. Um, Okay, and then that was something else. Yep, so that was the while loops one, and I think I've got one more. Um, Are you going to move on? Oh. Yeah, no, you yeah, carry on. Just yeah. before you move on. Yes. Um, I, to me, the, the most important thing about while loops is uh, for capturing input from a, the command line. Okay. So, so possibly if you wanted to, you know, in your examples, yes, you could, you could actually have an example of how do I um, get an integer from the from the user? So enter a number, mm. and if he types A B C, yes. then it's not a number. So mm. you know you, you do a, a is it a, 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 a returned input mm. uh, or int returned input equal value or something like that. value equals int returned input. Yes, and and a, a, a try on that. And if it fails, then you would. Loop back and go loop around again yeah. and say, you know, we have an error message, um, invalid, you know, yeah. input, and, and you'll stay in the while loop until they that they actually put in an integer. Yes. You get me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. really good, and I, I have, I haven't shown it here, but I've in the exercises I do have those sorts of ones where mm. it needs some input from the user. Um, and while it, that's a good one because you don't know how many times it's going to take the user to get, give the correct answer. Right. Like I think I've got one where it's like, uh, you know, guess the guess the number from one to ten, and you know it'll keep looping until um, until they guess that. Yeah. And that's it's one also, of the challenges. It's also to filter out um, bad data entry. Mm. You know, maybe you want a float. Maybe you want a boolean. Maybe you want an integer. Maybe you want a string. Mm. And so. You know, you you um, you have to write the code with maybe a try and accept. Yes. So whatever the return, and maybe you also want a prompt. Mm. You might say that you have a you know, indicate the prompt value is ten. So you just yeah. hit return, which will be an empty string. But then you actually have to uh, mm. move the, the the prompt value in, and, and um, it's valid. So you, you will you will exit the loop. Mm. Or the return. Yeah, that is. A lot of the examples, so like when you mentioned like try and accept, so I haven't covered that till later yeah. on. So that's one of the hard things because it's like you have to be quite make sure when you write the exercises, you aren't including concepts that they haven't already covered. Yeah. Um, and then what's the order in which I cover those? And you look at other courses and they've covered them in different orders. Um, so a lot of it's fairly try, trying to build on their knowledge. Um, but um, Actually, on that one, I'll, I'll go to the next exercise. Just oh, yes. on the topic, yep. so David has, has a few comments in, in the chat. Yep. Um, one was um, probably the most common programming fault in many other languages is the out by one error. Okay. Failing to start or end loops correctly, hence why we don't use loop indices in Python. Mm. So, I mean, that's a common fault when you, for instance, in Java or C or C++, if you do a reverse for loop counting down, then you quite often start off by one and you're not counting down to the last one to zero, for instance, because you're so used to it's less or then you just do greater than, but then you miss the zero that you still have to go and then you never actually go to your last array element or something. Mm. Um, so I agree with that. Um, sort of like each cases of, of these for loops are always a common pitfall. Mm. Um, and the other thing was it was more general. So if you are hiring, would you prefer someone with a certification from a recognized university or polytech or from a Udemy course presented by someone whose name is not easily recognized? Yeah, I mean, of course, the university course would be superior. Um, and Don't anyway, say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and you, I, this one thing, if you go on to like, 
I don't know if you use Twitter or something, there's people trying to sell their courses and they'll say, this is better than an MBA, you know, and you can learn this. And it's not better than an MBA. Like, so I'm pretty up for it, but like, but this is a good supplement to that. Mm. So maybe they're, you know, they've missed some lectures and they've got behind and then um, they've had that where people have said, you know, they did my SQL course and it helped them with their, yep. their paper that they were doing on databases. Mm. So yeah, I think um, it fits in the micro-credentials type world. Mm. I mean, you don't necessarily need to have a computer science degree, but you want to do some work in Python. Why would you spend four years doing that mm. where you learn all kinds of other things? All you need to do is I need to work with this API and I need to use a Python library, but I've never done Python, so. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, and there are courses that are like very specific, like um, they'll just focus on one library, like mm -hmm. Pandas course, um, you know, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that is an, that's a good question though. Uh, <laughs> And on Udemy as well, anyone can upload a course, yeah. right? And you think, now there are other providers where you've just got like Coursera and it's like just uh, university professors and, and whatnot um, putting up courses. But on Udemy you have a pretty good review system and if you can get good reviews and if you can produce good content, you can um, have a successful course. Mm -hmm. but it's all about picking it up. Top, yeah, so I think it's got a pretty good system um, of, you know that the high ranked courses are generally pretty good quality and they keep them up to date. It's also a challenge for the instructor to make sure that their videos are kept up to date. Um, um, that's probably why as well I like, like the PowerPoints. I like to create courses that will be, I don't have to update too much, so I'd like to create sort of a time loss course. Um, whereas if you're doing, say, a course for a specific API, you know, and that API is changing, then you have to always go back and update it. Um, and that's some complaints about some courses will be that, you know, all these videos were made a few, video, uh, few years ago and, this, and the, the scripts don't work anymore um, because they haven't kept it up to date. Um, here's an example of um, an exercise for the students to oh, oh, sorry, is there another question? No yeah, yeah, go for it. Oh, um, when, when they were saying when, when they develop courses, they have others check, referee, and critique, etc. Mm -hmm. And then he's basically asking, so who do you use to avoid, co to avoid cognitive bias and assumptions? Do you use your students in the first run of the course? Uh, I, I have to admit, I have, no, I haven't done that. I've usually just published the course mm. and then waited until I got feedback from the students. Right. This time around, I am thinking about giving the course to some people who, mm. uh, because it, with the other course, SQL, I knew it inside out, um, whereas mm. Python, I'm more new to. Yeah. So I'm yeah. probably going to, like, the likes of you guys are really good to get that feedback from. Mm. Um, yeah, so I probably will run it past some people and mm -hmm. give them like a, a peer review. Yeah. yeah. Um, a festival. So um, you get a group cognitive bias. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, but it's, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, as well. My like, eyeballs find more problems. Yes. So that's yeah. Be true, yeah. That's right. Um, Here's an example of one of the exercises that I've got the students to do, which um, is after they've covered functions, which is to create their own version of the max function. So Python's built-in max function. And um, yeah, so that's just explaining the max function. I'm going for an example. Um, let's go down a bit. Okay, here's the exercise here. So the task is to create their own function, call it find max. Um, I've just said here, it tends to make some number from a list of numbers, but it doesn't have to be just a list of numbers. Um, and note, don't use the Python's built-in max function that defeats the purpose of the exercise. Um, and this here is, 
I, so I do a bit of hand holding with the exercises because a lot of students really need it. Like, you, you know, when you're first learning, you, you are struggling even with some of the basics. Um, and so I'm trying to get them to think about how to actually approach the problem so that uh, they, can, they can try and generalize that to other situations. Too often they'll just, someone will go through the example solution, say, here's how you do it. But they haven't, go through, they haven't gone through the thought process that, that went into that. Um, and so often it seems like magic when you see the solution, it seems obvious, but then when you come to another situation where you have to apply those same concepts, it's pretty difficult because you haven't gone through the, the, the process of how to, how to approach the problem. Um, so here I'm saying, well, how would you do it if you were to do it by hand? How would you think about this problem just with a pen and paper? You don't even know how to code. Um, and you, you might say, well, okay, you might look at the first number and then you would say, well, this is my current known maximum because I've only looked at one number. So that would be your max value so far, value number five. Um, so the, the formatting seems a bit funny here, but yeah, then you would say, look at the next number and you'd say, well, is eight greater than your max value so far? And if it is, then you would update max value so far. So you update max value so far as a variable to eight. Um, and then you would go through each number. So if it wasn't greater than your max value so far, then you'd do nothing. Um, so that's trying to get them to think about, you know, just how to approach the problem. Um, and then I think I've got, um, okay, since we've evaluated all the numbers, um, yeah, the max value in this list is 25. And so you're repeating the same action over and over. So that indicates that you want to loop through every element in the, in the list. So that's thinking, okay, well, I need a loop. And I, within each loop, I need to do this um, check. So an if statement. Um, I've got some comments on there. Um, yeah, so that indicates that you want to use a loop. Um, yeah, so it's quite a lot. So I'm almost giving them the answer in some ways, but they often they kind of need that. Um, yeah, and I also will have some hints. Um, so for the students as well, at the very start, I didn't say this, but I'll say, if you want to have a go without having a look at all these hints, you know, I'll pause the video, pause the video now and give it a try. And if you get stuck, come back and look at the hints. Um, so here it's really spelling out what they, what they do. Um, but students tend to like this. They find it quite useful. Any questions from David? <laughs> um. You you introduced that you know you basically said there's a, a max function mm. as a, and it's a built-in, mm -hmm. but um, you know so you, it, it, at what point did you introduce uh, this is a list and the max function will only work on a list of num numeric data, mm. whereas a list can be multiple types of data. You see, in, in which case yeah. max will fail. Well, in this case here, actually, Max will still work with character strings as well. Um, and it'll do, I forgot what, it'll, you know, A to Z, Z will be treated as like larger. So, well, but in this example here, just to try and keep it simple for the student, I, I just said do it. Because a lot of Max, you can have 1, 2, A, B yeah. in a list. Mm. It's not, it doesn't have to be either. It can be a mixed bag of whatever. It can True, be. yeah, different data types. Other things. Yes. Yeah. Things, but anyway, yeah. So I do cover some of that stuff in the lists section, like, um, but yeah, I kind of, there are, there are those edge cases, um, and when I say, so when I put this into ChatGPT, then it'll say, well, you know, the correct way to do it is to have like a, a, a you know, try accept um, as, as well to check the data type, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then I haven't covered that. I haven't got to that in the course. So mm. I just kind of got a very simple situation. Yeah. And I like this example because it basically had a loop and it had an if statement inside the loop. 
and it's a kind of summed up what had just been covered before, which was loops mm -hmm. and conditional logic. I mean, it's basically just combining the things that you've learned, and now you're putting it into practice. Mm. And um, David, of course, has a question from the audience again. Sure. Um, I mean, like you mentioned, can the, or holding hands is sometimes important for some of the students, and I mm. think breaking down how to actually break down such a problem in small steps so you can translate it into code is quite good. Mm. And his question is now, because it's the problem sort of way of transfer them. So having given all these hints and help them sort of like to success in the find makes method, how do you then prove that the trainee has understood and could develop a similar algorithm without the hints? Do you have another exercise which is sort of like similar, but you can't just copy paste it? Yeah, I've got more exercise. So I'm leaving a lot of the exercises to the end, but mm -hmm. I will take that on board and something I'm thinking about is having exercises which don't have hints mm. for students that yeah. but are similar enough to the student to the exercises that they've already done mm. so they should be able to do it mm. and they should their mind should think oh this is similar to this other situation mm. and then get them to generalize mm. I think that's quite good um, to do yeah, just Oh, going back to what I said before. Yes. If I've got a, a list and it's got one, two, three, you know, one, comma, two, comma, three, and then it's got A. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Max data type. Yeah. And and if I try and do a max on that, yes. Um, the error message is greater than not supported between instances of string and int. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. There's no kind of warning that that the the um, uh, you know, it's not going mm. you know, to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but if, if it was all, I think it's all the same strings, then it would work. But if it's in the air, like yeah. strings so and integers, yeah. and yeah. then it's not. Um, yeah. But rather than sort of like making this particular simple problem more complicated with try, accept, and error checking and all yeah. these, I will probably just mention it. We actually mm. need to do error checking because. Mm. It's just to keep things simple, and then at a later uh, lecture, sort of like we actually have try accept in there and whatnot. Yes. You can do actually error handling, and you pick up that same example again, and now we make it robust because mm. you can, for instance, introduce tests, how to write tests. Mm. So we have this code, and now we write tests for it, mm. like unit tests or whatever. We yes. send in integers, we send in floats, we send mixed integers and floats, and now mm. we have strings, and it goes flat. So you go back, fix the code, run run the tests, and write more tests for it. Yes, I think I will actually add that in, because I didn't mention about that this one in you know, real life situation, mm. we have the error handling. Yeah. Um, and just say that we will cover it later on in the oh, course. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, but I didn't include that, I don't think. So, I will, I think that's very good. I will include that. The, the other thought is, you know, you just sort of introduced this find max, mm. which is max, um, uh, but it's, it's part of a group of like, I would say, three functions. There's the max, a min, and a sum. Yes. And you probably add a length, a length to it as well. So, those yes. are things that you can. Functions you can apply to a list. Mm. Yeah. So to just sort of pull max, to the max. If, if you actually um, uh, get a list and do a DIR on, on that the variable that is that list, mm -hmm. it doesn't suggest that there's a max in there or a min or a sum. Like yes. The help doesn't. It, it, it's it's a separate kind of function. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so I'm just thinking you you've introduced. Um, you yeah, know, max, and so people automatically know what it is. Yes. And, then, and, and you're trying to teach iteration, basically, aren't you? Yeah. You, don't, yeah, you yeah. don't want them to take the shortcut that Python provides, and you want mm. them to run and write an iterator. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just, I just wonder whether that, if you just come up and say that Python has a fine max, whether people go, oh, yeah, does it? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I think um, I have covered, I, I think early in the course I did cover okay. Max 
but then I did a bit of a refresher at the start. But yeah, you are right, because people use that sort of group of functions, maximum, sum, together. Um, well, there was something, I don't know whether you've looked back on any of the uh, presentations that have been done here before, but mm. there was a guy who used to come along here called Lawrence, and he okay. would present an introduction to Python course. Uh, and I always noticed when he did lists, he never mentioned about um, sum, max, oh, or min that yes. could be applied to a list. Yeah, uh, yeah, and yet it, it, it's sort of one of the first things you can go for to get away from iterators. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's that when you're trying to teach iterators. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, in, in the real life, they wouldn't need, they don't need. To, so that was one of my um, hesitations of including this example because I thought, and I know this will happen, is students will say, "Well, what's the point of this? There's already a max function." But the point of the is the to apply the concepts that they've learned earlier and to think through the process because mm -hmm. they may be able to use that sort of same thinking to approach to different problems. Mm -hmm. I know that I had um, one work colleague many years ago, I remember he went on a you know two-day Python course and they had to program a clock and he said, what was the point of it? You know, I'm never going to use this. But it's like, okay, well, <laughs> it wasn't so much about the end result, it was about the learning process yeah. and those concepts that you're learning. Um, so, yeah, um, and I thought it was, yeah, yeah, but anyway, I've done it a little bit of time, but. <laughs> so, so Dan was saying as well that he was talking about the built-in function, the min max and so on. Yes. Um, and when Ian was pushing through the mixed list, it craps out because there's no comparison, right? And with a find max method, you can have your own custom error handling sure. and gracefully yeah. recover and handle these erroneous sort of like input data by the user, for instance, and then mm. just output a warning but continue. And then you can say, this yes. is, for instance, an example why you would use a custom method rather than a built-in one because you want to handle these things better. Yeah, and I can even come back to this example when I get to covering error handling mm. and then yeah. use this, revisit the example yeah. and, and, and expand saying, on it. And on the last slide here, Ian, yes, we know we can do it with the built-in function max, but mm. later on you will find out why we won't. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. Because so definitely I, I did find with the SQL courses that students won't just do the, and it's good that they do this, they won't just do the exercise, but they will play around and mm. test out different scenarios. And why didn't it work when I to play an extra column and then you have oh, to yeah. explain, you know, explain why the result's different and so on. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much all I've got actually. I think I've covered, oh actually I'll show you guys, oh yeah, the course planner. So I, I think you guys will have a lot of hints on this. So, um, oh, yeah, oh, well, this. This. <laughs> I think we've got a key. Um, Okay, so this is my course planner so far. Um, and I actually, this was a real mistake because I started off doing the installs of everything. Oh. And then I should have left it to the very end because then there, you know, when I recorded it, it was like Python version 3.8 or something. Mm -hmm. and now it's like 3.12 or 11, I can't remember what it is. It doesn't matter. Um, and then the you know the, the the website they're changing the interface all the time and, and people think that's and it's an old course because it, it, you haven't the install video was done like a year ago so I started this course at the start of the year. Oh, that's the other thing. If you're thinking about making a course, it takes like way longer than you expect. Oh, so I know that. <laughs> I did one class on a uh, data mining book and it took me forever. Yeah. So you have, this is what I'm going to talk about, then you record, and I said, oh man, this didn't work, I forgot about that, and then yeah, so many mistakes till you get it right, and then shit, that video is way too long. I yeah. didn't think so, I wouldn't even cover five minutes, but it turned out to be 15, so okay, so you have to go back to chop it up again, so it's a nightmare, so. Yeah, the video is a thing. actually doing a full course, eh, hey, boy. Yeah, but the video yeah. editing takes me quite a long time mm -hmm. to do. Um, just because I make mistakes and think, oh, you know, I've got to redo that part. Yeah. Does, does Mac OS not include Python? 
That's it. What? Home rule or that's part of it's it's still by default on that side, is it not? Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm not a Mac person, so I just included these as like I need to do a Mac version of the Windows videos I've already done. And then I so for my um SQL course that I did, I um SQL, there was SQL Server, and to get SQL Server working on a Mac, you have to use a Docker container. Yeah, oh, it's so awesome. <laughs> it's like you just—it's like quite light, and you've got SQL Server coming on. But why have you used yeah. SQL Server in the first place? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you work with the watch like tech, right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm not disagreeing with you, but yeah. but Docker is just out of real. Yeah, I mean, I I use Docker on a daily basis with data mining because. All those stupid dependencies with CUDA and everything and Python libraries is a nightmare. Yeah. Docker is the only way. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. not really. Like, it's only SQL Server. But yeah, yeah, having SQL yes. Server Docker that expands the course slightly, having Docker that as well. Yeah, because then it expands to people who are on a Mac. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem with that is that I borrowed my sister's Mac to do that, and then everything worked fine. Mm -hmm. But then I'm getting all these course questions about. How come it's not working on my Mac and I've got an M2 chip and yeah. uh, you know um, stuff like that? And then it took me a really long time to try and debug what was happening because I haven't got my own Mac. Mm -hmm. So that's something that um, I actually yeah. need to buy a Mac. <laughs> so well, that's actually why I've given given up on one set of plugin structures on the Mac because every new version is completely different. Nothing works anymore. So yeah, I cut out basically my Mac support. Mm. I don't have one, and I was at the same thing that I was borrowing a, a colleague's one so they can run it. Yeah. Okay, this is how it works, and then six yeah. months down the track, everything's different. It's like, oh no. I'm still using like uh, uh, Intel based Mac mm. because I'm ready to move to a, mm. an N series Mac, yeah. mm. I have to change all my configs to so yeah. the Docker, so yeah. to loads of ARM based. Mm. If you find one, if you find an image that's ARM based, because if it's not cross compiled, if it's just for Intel, then that's it. I have to, I have to make one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's one. But certainly, I think Python and, and Linux and Mac uh, much better experience than Windows mm -hmm. out of the box. Mm. Uh, they will really have Python instead. Uh, but typically, the one that the box is yeah. not necessarily the most current. Yeah, I'll see if you can yeah. Okay. I mean, I personally used to be a fan of Anaconda, but I've actually gone away from it again on the witness because it's too bloated. Yeah, I, I, my thinking with that yeah. was that I, if they install the Anaconda distribution and then I just use those libraries that mm. come with the distribution, then I'm not going to have any problems with them asking questions about installing certain libraries mm. and they're having trouble with that, yeah. you know, installing yeah, something. Yeah. I know. Because um, although... The VS Code, yeah. I think, if you install VS Code and then you install the extensions for the Python, mm. then that will it automatically install some of that stuff. Okay. Process. Yes. That, that's been my experience. So yeah. I, I've not installed Anaconda or Jupyter there, but by virtue of using Visual Studio Code, and this is on my Windows machine for work, so mm. it just pulls all that stuff up and you don't have to think about it. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. So, yeah. When you install Python for Windows, <coughs> which I once did about five years ago, um, I thought it brought in idle, you know, the and, and I thought it was more. Yeah, um, I know it's not very pretty though, you know. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, but you, I mean, if you're coding a course for, for people who want to be developers, then this is to your code in the But, yeah. but yeah. I, I thought it was about, I mean, not this, not, not promoting idle, but yes. I thought there were about five other things. Like, isn't there a sort of a help? Instead of going DIR, um, mm. you know, A or bracket, A bracket or whatever, um, you can actually. Do that with a GUI. Um, not not you, sure, to be honest. And I thought that um, downloaded as part of Python for Windows. Um, 
Uh, my, I just know that it comes from Wido. I don't know about the other yeah. stuff. Um, yeah. So, so for a beginner, mm. if you know, the pro I'm quite happy going DIR mm. or whatever and, and seeing what all the different functions or methods are associated with, the, with, with say, a list or something like that. Yes. And then, yeah. oh, yeah, I'll use that one. Um, <laughs> but, but this was a, a nice GUI way of doing it. Okay, I'm just trying to think. But I don't know whether it's still, I'm pretty sure you didn't have to ask for any, you went and downloaded Windows, and mm. when you uh, launched it, you had about five different icons you could click on, one being Python uh, itself, uh, the, the launch, but yeah, the other ones were sort of one being idle, and then there's this help thing. Uh, I don't know whether it's changed. Or it might have, I think it might have changed, because I did download Python the other day, because I got a new computer, and yeah, I think I don't remember having to click on anything for the, any extras. Yeah. It was just like you had your add to path option where you click on or off, and that was basically it, from what I remember. Okay. Um, that was just using the Windows installer. Right. Um, okay, well, it might have changed. Uh, the, yeah, it was a long time ago. The, there was, there is actually uh, on Udemy, there's a um, I've forgotten his name, but he is quite a good instructor, and he, he did a very good Excel course and then did a Python course. It was only a few hours long, and his whole Python course, he just used Idle. And it's actually one of the better selling courses. Um, and I think that was where he wanted to really minimize the um, amount of problems that the student would encounter. But the downside of that is that in the real world, they're probably not going to be using idle to do their code development. <laughs> I mean, they could do. Uh, I had a work colleague who just, yeah. it was just used that and he, he was quite happy with it. Um, and you see, sometimes the problem in learning a programming language is if you have an IDE that does a lot of work for you, mm. you're not remembering things. If you actually just open up a plain editor with nothing in it, mm. you just mm. write something and then execute it. That actually makes you think about, so, oh, what was that command again? Mm. Rather than, oh, do you mean this? Do you mean that? Oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean, I have the problem nowadays as well because, oh, damn, what was that method then again? Oh, yeah, yeah, that one. And then if, yeah. if the IDE doesn't tell me, it's like, uh, okay, read the documentation. Oh, that's the one. So yeah. you get lazy. So from that point of view, I think when starting yeah. out with a programming language, at least, for well, the first, let's say, few hours, you should definitely actually just use a plain editor and run mm. with it. And that really helps sort of like what? getting that muscle memory going for actually typing. Yeah. Right and yeah. It's like the, because with these IDEs, like the code completion and mm. stuff, to, those sorts of tools make it too easy. Um, yeah. But then you're like not. Like to yeah. you know, you just wait and then it'll tell you what it's going to write. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I remember a work colleague telling me that um, if this was before ChatGPT, you know, you cut and paste some code from Stack Overflow and then you change mm -hmm. a few variables. And said, is it, it's better to actually type it out yourself because that's how you learn it. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I think I've got yeah I've got yes or no for recorded. So these ones I have those ones in yellow I haven't recorded, um, and I it's really hard to know what to include and what not to, um, because I'm at six hours of content already, um, and I mean this could go on forever. And at some point I want to like just cut it off. <laughs> so. <laughs> There are definitely some things like you mentioned about error handling that I don't think I even have on here. Um, but uh, yeah, and I, I've grayed out the ones with the, because I was going to do um, ones where I covered all the exercises and then went through the solutions, because that's what I did for my second courses. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm thinking now, otherwise it'd take me forever. So I'm just thinking of just providing the, the um, like, the, Exercises in a document and then the solutions in a notebook or notebooks. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, so that's my thinking behind that. Um, 
And what else do I cover? Oh, I covered escape sequences. Um, just because some people get you know confused with um, with that um, in the file paths, and that can be a source of um, problems um, because um, Windows uses the backslash, and then you can have um, backslash n in your file path, and then if they haven't um, dealt with that properly, it can cause problems. For the student. Sorry, I did a separate video. I probably didn't need to do that, but I did a short video on that to make sure that people on a Windows, they know what to do. Um, yeah. Um, you can get around that if you're using forward slashes. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, I can, so that's, you can either use forward slashes or in front of the file path, you can use like lowercase r, and then that'll treat the rest of it as like a string. Yeah. Uh, if you use r, then it's a regular expression. <laughs> yeah. It's we, not a path at all. Um, it, I think it's like a trick to do the, yeah, I know you can use it as a regular yeah, expression, yeah. but if you put it in front of the file path and you've got all backslashes, then it will treat that. Oh, is it? Oh, oh yes, okay. Oh, God, that's a hack. <laughs> because it won't treat the, 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 well, the I, I uh, can backslash show you. N or backslash B or backslash T in there. It treats it as, as an extra unescaped. UTF string. It, oh God, don't do that. Well, okay, so I. Oh. <laughs> I did, well, that's interesting. So yeah, yeah. I, I did. I covered both ways. You yeah, can put yeah. the arm front, or you can do. Yeah, but the it's, 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 it's an using regular expression. It's not. It's not. It's not my it's not okay. the purpose for it. It's because um, well, for GIS, there's a commonly used library called ArcPy because there's a programming for GIS called ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS and um, and in all their examples they have code examples that's what they do they put a whole case out and put all file parts so I thought okay well it seems no, to be no, no, no. okay <laughs> well I said you can use the two backslashes or you yeah. can use a forward slash yeah. or you yeah, can use those whole case out what Damon also suggested in the chat is pathlet so okay yeah. building up paths and whatnot oh really okay yeah, yeah. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. Alright, Yeah, I'll look yeah. into that. Okay, that's quite good. I will probably look at that rather than that. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely a problem with escape sequences mm. that you can point out there. You can run into problems if you do yes. that. But rather than, you can say, yes, you can switch to forward slashes, which is sort of supported, but not great either. Okay. Or you can actually completely avoid this problem by using Pathlet. Okay. Paths, for instance. Right. Is that. Is that a library? That's a library. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. Something you would have to install though. Yeah. In that sense. So it's not the yeah. core. David, uh, Pamphlet, is it part of Python standard library or is it something you have to install? I'm not a user myself. Um, it's part of the standard that would be good. Um, All right, David. Do you know whether Pamphlet is part? Of the standard library. It is oh, okay. It is part of the standard library. Oh, right, okay. All right. So I will. I'll make a note of that. That's quite good. That's why I do this. So yeah, yeah. Get that feedback. Yeah, um, you should tell those ArcGIS people off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or they. I've uh, showed some examples, but yeah, yeah. They, they do that. Um, um, one thing, just looking through those. I yes. guess your example code is all just straight line going going down, like executes one after another. Whereas yes. I wonder at what point do you introduce, say, the format of a, or the template <coughs> for a program where, you know, at the bottom you've got if name equals main, equal, oh, yeah, the if name equals main, and then you might call up to a, a a function called main, and main might have a whole lot of routines that it calls to, to run the program. Yeah, so when you teach this, the sort of structuring, are you trying to, uh, as you sort of mean, get into that object oriented programming and yeah, those concepts? Yeah, I that. yeah. yeah I, I'm sort of debating whether I will be able to get because I imagine that I'll get, I've got here where it's got methods, and I'm, I'm thinking, well, okay, that's where I have to start. 
kind of bringing that in, but I may not, I may have to cut that out. I'm still on whether I'll have time to do that because um, that is such a big topic. Um, and I know that that is the, so it's a Python course for beginners. Um, I'm hoping I can get it, um, fit it in. So uh, I know that um, like uh, the guy who I mentioned earlier, Andy Harris, he has a video where he talks about the seven big concepts in programming. So, um, you know, floats, um, variables, etc. And, and he said there's only about seven of them when you really drill it down. Mm. And I think it, the seventh one was object-oriented programming. Um, so I do... It's a big topic, so yeah. the question is whether you would probably leave that for... I mean, the thing is, anything in, in, in Python is an object anyway, so an integer that you have is an object already. True. So yep. you're kind of like ignoring this whole thing, or you mm. have strings, lower, upper, split, and all these functions that you actually have on the string object. I'm not sure whether you're actually doing anything with that. Sorry, say that again for so the... So if you have, um, some, for example, a string with white spaces in there, you can just call dot split and it splits it basically on white space so you mm. can like, get the words of the sentence. Um, do you do these sort of like object I, functions already or do you just rely on built-in functions and for loops and these things to introduce basically concepts of programming in Python? I do want to get to that. Mm. Um, so yeah, there are definitely lots of methods they can use. I don't want the student to be like, oh, you know, I have to use a loop and try and do everything myself mm -hmm. when there's already built-in methods, mm -hmm. like um, split to et cetera, yeah. that they can use. Um, but then I, I, I didn't want it to be just, because I have seen some other courses where they do like a separate video for each built-in method. And then, you know, and then they can just do quite a long sort of, you know, like, and it just becomes like an encyclopedic course when that's stuff mm. that the student could look up themselves. But yeah. I definitely want to make them familiar for the commonly used, say, string and list methods and yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Um, so that's my thinking behind that. Um, and then, yeah, I've got here like a focus on um, each of the data types. So I think it's like I would put that into the, I've actually got a couple of videos on this, mm -hmm. but um, uh, actually I should add those in because I actually have done that now, mm -hmm. but still got the dictionaries, um, sets, mm -hmm. I've done that one, mm -hmm. yeah. Because of that you're actually using objects directly without actually having introduced it for an object is right in a class. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and that object-oriented programming is notoriously difficult to teach and for people to understand as well. So I think it would take me quite a while to do it justice, mm. especially when I'm not that well versed mm -hmm. in it. Um, but one of the good things about Udemy is you can publish your course and then you can come back to it and add videos later on. Um, so that's what I did with the SQL course. Originally, it was 11 hours longer, uh, 11 hours long, and then I added a couple of hours of videos to it over the next, um, over the following year. So I can actually sort of publish the course, start getting some feedback, and then keep adding to it over time. Um, but I do want to get to that, even for my own self. To learn. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, so, because you're sort of, with list dictionaries and sets and whatnot, mm. you're touching up on the built-in classes. So rather than teaching how to write your own classes, you can say, well, there's this whole world, anything in Python is actually an object, mm. which allows you to operate on itself and do stuff with it. And you will see that go down the track. And then yes, you could always then further on beyond those built-in classes. Yeah then introduce object-oriented programming further down the track if you wanted to, but it's mm. not necessary that you have to write your own classes and whatnot. Yes. It's just for them to understand the concept that you instantiate a dictionary, which is a class into an object, and then you can operate and call methods on oh, this object, object yeah. and append, clear, and all these things. Mm. And, yeah, something that I... Uh, 
have done in the past where I've done sort of like a promise, like, we'll be covering this later on. Oh. And then it's like, oh, I ran out of time or I forgot to cover that later on. And then so now I don't make much promises. Yeah. <laughs> I like, no, that's, that's but um, yeah. so sometimes it's like for those ones, I might, if I start talking about classes and stuff, then this student may have questions about that. And if they haven't covered it, um, then it gets a bit complicated if I run out of time to cover it. Um, but I have been watching videos on that and seeing how other instructors teach that mm. topic. And what I've found is that it seems like a quite a difficult topic for them to explain without using lots of analogies. Mm. Um, and and also seems like I've one instructor said that it's like notorious for um, students having trouble with it and mm -hmm. to explain it. Um, so it's one that I hope I can get to this year at least. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I will be able to get to it. Right. Just yeah. one thought, Dan. Um, unless I've, it's off, I've missed it, but I don't see you covering the import, the old import libraries. No, and no, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Because uh, I think you should at least import sys so that they learn sys.exit. So they know how to put a break into their code. Okay. As they write it, you can, you know, you can run the code down to here and then do a sysexit. And you know, oh, it works for there. And then move it down to the, you know, the, the Or sysrg in order to have command line arguments. Sorry? Sysrgv. Command line arguments oh. to your script, for instance. Yeah, I, cause, well, because I'm just using the libraries that come with Anaconda, I haven't covered any about importing your own libraries. No, this is part of the system. Oh, this, yeah, 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 yeah. Having the import that you don't have to write just the built in functions, you can also import from the standard library. Pathlet would be also an import path. From the, yes. So it's not something you have to install, oh. it comes with Python. I think I have got that actually at the, some of the early examples. Um, this like, um, and I think I will and definitely when I come to do the, the input. The files that you have to import OS yeah. yeah. When I do the, I haven't actually come to it, but when I do the file mm. input yeah. output, yeah. then I'll have to, you know, show the import, yeah. Yeah. Um, import um, OS yeah. and what have you. Yeah. Um, yeah, the um, other thing was. If you're getting into importing, then do you show someone writing their own library that they import? So a piece of Python code imports some other code they've written mm. and, and then carries on. Is that quite common? I'm just saying. We have so many libraries that are used. Yeah, but even with a project, you yeah. Import from somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's what I use in my own sort of like libraries and whatnot. Mm. Because you split it in multiple modules that you group logically and whatnot. Mm. And then there's basic functionality and then just build something larger on top of that. Mm. Rather than one module with 2,000 lines of code that does okay. everything. Yeah. Yes. So you, and you just get your file. Yeah. Which turns it into import. Yeah. It can just be a, a whole series of functions. In, in a you know, additional functions mm. to apply mm. could be the module. Yes. Then, as you initially, when you write the code, you may not you may have written all in one big long mm. set with a whole lot of set functions. But then you just you know they all work. So bundle them off into another file. Yeah. Okay. And you know if I call this, the result's going to be this. You know the yeah. return yeah. value coming back to your find mix. Yes. That would be something that you might want to use in multiple programs that you write. Mm. So you move that out into another module that you then import rather than copy pasting it into each sort of like each time that you need to use it. Mm. So it's like about reusability of code then. Yeah. And you build up like a library of stuff that you can then actually use. Mm. Yeah, I had remember one work colleague who because I just do sort of scripting or everything in one mm. notebook. But I know that he did that. He created his own modules. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that. Do you think that would be more advanced for a beginner course? Because I haven't I really think, seen it covered in the beginner courses. I'd probably leave. Can you have sort of like an outlook what other things you can do? 
Yeah, I, well, that's what I, because I, how I envision this course would it be a springboard mm -hmm. to other courses because I can't cover everything, but I just wanted to cover the basics mm -hmm. really well and to get that have a like strong foundation. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I could have that in sort of the outro, like. Yeah, and then just cover things that you haven't really talked yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. And like stuff where, um, like I think with some of the working with files and stuff, I know that like you can use pandas to do a lot of that stuff. And then, but I'm, I didn't want it to turn it into like a no, full data that. analysis course, you know? Yeah. 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 If you do do this importing and they write a lot of little functions in there, isn't there a catch you've got to put out? It will execute when you do the import. It will run, run the module. Yes. So that's if you have uh, the importing a module and you have code that's not in methods, then it will get executed, like initializing variables yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So one of the things you could, should do is put the if name it is main main at the bottom of your module. Yeah. Otherwise. You're going to call something and run it twice. If that's what I mean. uh, or if you, you import it and it runs, runs It then. runs automatically. Yeah. So you, Which is a tangent and side effect. Yeah. One thing as well was like, um, get your advice on for the, when I've got some for the loop lectures and I haven't covered the like continue and break yeah. keywords. Yeah. And if I should cover that, if we're going to course, yeah. definitely, okay. Yeah. All right. uh, if you go back to your find max method, yes. Ian, naughty boy, he's not putting just integers in, but he's also putting strings in. Yeah. So you try accept. Mm. It craps out when it's trying to compare an integer and a string. Mm. And then you could sort of like have a break in the accept one while we encountered something that's dodgy. Yeah. We are putting an error message and then do a break to exit our for loop mm. and then we return that. So what we found so far is this makes fun. Okay. But there's some dodgy things in here or return none mm. if you do an error. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, if, if you can, if you getting back to like you imp uh, mentioning the import statement. Yes. Then yeah. that's quite a good one where you can have continue or break. Okay. If you're in a, a true, you know, if true, and then the person, you say enter a number and the person types something, or well, they hit return, mm. at, at that point, oh, yeah. you would analyze it, you decide, do we continue and go back through the loop again? I see. Or do we break out of the, the loop? Yeah. 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 So, in other words, we've got valid data, so we mm. can break out. That's a good one. Um, one video I saw, they sort of said that when students first encounter the, the break and the continue, they tend to overuse them. I don't know if you agree with that or... Yeah. Um, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a differentiation between the iterate through everything mm. or do you not know when to stop? And that's basically when you do have a break. Yeah. But if you know, you have to look at all, and like if you find mix, you actually have to look at all the yeah, items right, yeah, in the list, the yeah. and you don't normally have a break in the end. Mm. That would be only if something strange is happening, like a string appears or whatever. Okay. Um, but if you're looking for a character in a string, well, yeah, 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 where you where you, you don't find know. it, you mean you can break yeah, it. yeah. I got it. Yeah. yeah, and you find what you're looking for, break out of it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the reason I harp on about it is I probably went for a year before I worked out how to actually get data input. You know, when I started learning Python, yes, whatever I was glancing at, I never found examples that were how how do how do you get input into the into a program sort of thing. And maybe I should add something like because I'm keen to add some stuff where it may not be covered in another course. But it's something that people should really know about or would be helpful about. Well, but sure. When someone starts to write a program, the first thing they want is I want to be able to input my parameters and data into yes. the program. Yeah. In which they need to load from a file or they, they can be prompted and type in. So, mm. 
So um, we should yeah. have a devil section. Of this. <laughs> what is that? Devil. Yeah. Yeah. Another mark, I think, of oh. it for the confederation. Yeah. Another thing to bear in mind is um, with Linux, anyway, there's, there's a dictionary file. There's an English and a, and a US dictionary file basically shipped with the Linux system. Yeah, I know about. But, but that can be handy if you want to teach loops or something like that, because it gives you 100,000 words that, you know, of data that you can loop through or mm. you know, look for the words that start with upper, uppercase and mm. you know, all the cities in the world and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, but I don't know whether Windows provides that problem. Yeah, I don't know. And I haven't, yeah, I, I, maybe I should do, because. I've, and it seems like quite common that people will just do the Mac OS and Windows, and I guess the Mac OS is similar enough for Linux. I don't know, I don't use Linux, but you know, they, they comprehensively I'd show Windows, Mac OS, and Linux um, for the install and get started. Just for this course, I've just used Jupyter Notebooks. Mm -hmm. um, I've got here a Jupyter Lab, but I'm not actually going to use that. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh, I, but I did have an install video for Visual Studio Code because it is so commonly used. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know one other course, they actually showed a whole bunch of like, here's how you install PyCharm and get started, here's how you use Video Studio Go, um, and a couple of others. Um, yeah, so uh, that's pretty well it. I'll thank you for your guys' feedback, oh, for the cool. experts. Yeah, so, um, thanks yeah. for that. It's awesome effort. Yeah. Yeah. Well <laughs>